Hello, everybody, and welcome to this edition of the Advisor Tech Unplugged podcast. My name is Tess Lee. I'm Managing Director of Money Info, and I am delighted to be joined today by Abraham Akasoya, who is CEO and founder of Timeline. Hi, Abraham. How are you doing? I'm very well, Tess. Thank you very much for having me. Oh, it's an absolute pleasure to have you here. Hopefully this will be a good conversation um, today. So to get us started, um, tell us a little bit about yourself for those that are listening that don't, I know most people will probably know who you are already, but tell us a little bit about yourself and what you do and kind of how you got to, to where you are today. Yeah, sure. Thank you. For for those who've been living under the rock. <laughs> <laughs> um, how long have we got? No, I'm joking. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so... so uh, I, I I came into this great profession, uh, you know, started my career in 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 banking, and then I got fired from RBS, as I tell <laughs> people, <laughs> and uh, kind of spent two years in in career wilderness, you know, round about the the great financial crisis, trying to figure out what I would do next, and then ultimately I went on to uh, you know start a company called Finalytic which was a consultancy for the financial advice, financial services industry. And, you know, we, we grew that business from zero <laughs> to, to, to five people and uh, essentially consulting for some of the best and brightest financial planning firms, as well as, um, you know, big ones, you know, Transact, Aviva uh, yeah. and, and the likes. And I came to a conclusion during that sort of nearly de decade of consultancy experience that uh, financial advice technology sucks. The, <laughs> the, the technology that underpins the way advisors do things, uh, not, not just advisors, not, not just the advice bit, but also things like, you know, platform, um, I think to an extent of model portfolio as uh, lacking advice, uh, sorry, lacking technology. So, um, and, you know, when you go around the country screaming and breathing down people's neck and telling them that they're, is this, can I swear on this podcast? <laughs> we didn't hear, I don't know whether we've got a bleeper. Well, you might uh, get bleeper. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah get I'm bleeper. not fussy. <laughs> you, you know, and nobody, uh you know, for the for the most part, you know, many of the providers uh, ignored uh, me or what I was saying. I think you know, I got the signal that nobody is ever going to take me on the offer. And so, you know, in two thousand and eighteen, we began the journey uh, that is timeline. So we we set up the the, the company, and here we are today. Um, you know, with forty four people in the company, and the mission is really to. Uh, create best of breed technology that helps uh, advisors uh, plan, invest, and um, deliver advice to 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 their clients properly. And what what is it about when you came into this? What what was it that made you think the tech out there just sucks? Was it that it was dated? That was a lack of it? What was it that you thought? Hang on, this needs to be done done better. Yeah, very good question. So it, it's a couple of things. The the fundamental one is that the infrastructure that advice is built on today is based on pre-digital age, right? Yeah. So the technology by that, I mean the platform, the CRM, indeed even things like cash flow for the most part, is built on uh, infrastructure that is pre the digital age. Yeah. And so it's old and dated and creaking at the seams. And the way you would know this is that when we originally set up Timeline in 2018, I went out, we only started wanting to do one thing, which is model retirement outcomes. And in the subsequent year, I went out to integrate, right, with third parties. I spoke to platforms. We asked them to send them our, send us their API, back office systems. And, and we spent, you know, a lot of money, you know, nearly a million pounds, actually, trying to make things join up 
you wouldn't be surprised as that it just does not work. Everybody throw the, you know, the framework around APIs around. The reality is that, and, you know, a, a few platform CEOs, are, you know, accepted this. They cannot build APIs that will talk to modern digital technology. Mm. You know, you have the good old bulk, bulk valuations, which is if people really know what these things are, it's essentially, you know, X, you know, XML files being thrown around in, in, in the cloud. That's not APIs. And you can count the number of um uh you know platforms uh advisor technology with true modern functional apis you can count the number of providers who can offer this um on your fingers on no hand basically <laughs> yeah. so so i came to the conclusion that the old thing's broken we can try to stick plasters um you know in, in it maybe uh but I believe that you know we we need more of a a, a transformation in in this space. And I think I would agree. There's two things I, I pick up from you on that. One is that you're absolutely right about pre digital age. Most of these systems have been built from the back office outwards, not from the client backwards. So mm -hmm. which is where you know we've got the client more digitally involved involved in processes now. But I also think in terms of integration, we've struggled with that as well. We're in a very similar similar place to you, similar sized size business to you. And it is hard being David to Goliath, isn't it, sometimes and getting listened to, right? But it's also, I feel, not just about the technology capability, it's the mindset as well that mm -hmm. needs changing, isn't it? And I think you mentioned the term best of breed we would class ourselves in the best of breed you know, market and we want our clients like you do to be able to use other best of breed technologies. But if you if you don't have that mindset, you're not going to get anywhere. And if we don't all start to understand that our place in the te technology ecosystem doesn't have to be everything, right? We've all got We've all got the value that we can bring in that tech stack. And I think you're right. I think there is, I think it's improved somewhat, but I think there's a long way to go to, to get us to be, a really well integrated ecosystem and of course there are challenges that you know you and i and every other technology firm has got their own agendas and their own roadmaps to follow so that that brings the challenges but i think yeah i think we could do a lot more but it you know having these kinds of conversations is starting to open up that dialogue i hope and you know as uh, as timeline gets bigger as money info gets bigger we get a little bit more powerful and our clients can help us hopefully push some things forward as well yeah, I, I, and I think that more than, you know, most people in this space, you guys are, have done an incredible job trying to integrate to third parties, uh, you know, providers, platforms, uh, you know, the, the least of the, the, the providers that, that you guys are, are, are integrated with is, is more than anyone. Now, I, I accept that um in, in in some cases you know you're relying on their technology you can only uh you yeah. can only you can only use what is whatever it is they they give you but you've done an incredible job aggregating these um and you you've even gone as far as bringing open banking i think you you guys are yeah, one of the first have. to yeah. bring open banking into into the space um you've approached this from a client point of view and created that single hub for clients to be able to to see their 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 financial life you know so kudos to you for uh you know going against the grain of uh, conventional wisdom in our <laughs> right back at you Abraham <laughs> but thank you for that and did you did you always want to be in in finance in finance because I find when I talk to people most people kind of fall into financial services I wanted to be an archaeologist I wanted to be the next Indiana Jones classics <laughs> and archaeology at the university and then figured out I needed to pay some rent when I left and thought <laughs> actually I'll, I'll look in the paper and this financial advice firm looks interesting I'll, I'll try for a job there and the rest is history but what about yourself were you was it an area that you had an interest in or what was it that kind of got you into this you know to, to go into your master's and to uh, and to to get into into financial services 
Yeah, I mean, if there's one constant through sort of my, um, you know, young adulthood, um, it, for me, it was, I, I was absolutely clear I wanted to be an entrepreneur. This has been my dream and desire since okay. I was a since I was a little boy. Now I wouldn't call it on I wouldn't I wouldn't know the word uh, entrepreneur at that point, but I know that I wanted to work for myself. I wanted to run businesses, and so. But um, you know, I went to university and I actually studied agriculture. Oh wow! Okay in uni right not just in fact this is terrible right not just for first degree but for second degree as well my master's was also uh, not in finance and in, in, in agriculture but I had known by the time I was in my final year uh, in the first degree and you should ask me why I didn't go, go and study finance uh, in, in the master's level but I had known that I wanted to go into to to financial services so I read a book um you know, by Jim Rohn, I think it was called Seven Habits of Highly, Highly, yeah. uh, sorry, Seven Strategies for, for, for Wealth and Happiness by Jim Rohn. Seven Habits is a different book. And then I went on to re read another book as a as an 18 year old, um, you know, Rich Dad, Poor Dad by Robert Kiyosaki. And that was when I decided I wanted to go into, into finance, but I didn't get my first job in finance until I had got two degrees in agriculture. And then I said, I'm not doing that anymore. I'm going to go into financial services. Got, got the first job um, at, at HSBC uh, and the rest is history. So I, 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 I don't say that I fell into finance because I made a conscious choice to go into it. Uh, but I would have wished, I maybe I wished I, went, I actually studied finance in, in you know in university but you know I don't think it matters anyway. uh, hindsight's a wonderful thing though isn't it and you can't you know no regrets I always say you've got to li live life and life takes you on whatever path it's going to lead you on doesn't it and eventually you know you get to, to where you want to be if you if you work hard and if you're inspired and motivated so that's that's brilliant and what and you know there, there may well be some young people just entering into kind of financial planning and, and, and this industry now, what, what piece of advice would you give to them if you were to look back at, you know, kind of your journey through in terms of, you know, we're, we're keen, aren't we, to encourage more young people into the, into the profession to get more, you know, we're seeing lots of younger planners coming through, which is brilliant. What would you say to them knowing what you know now? I would say what you, what, where you come from, what you've done, up to this point, doesn't really matter much, good or bad, right? You know, your background, um, you know, what you studied at uni, right? All of those things yeah. don't really matter much. What matters going forward is your attitude and your approach to building a career. And I would say focus on a going out there to meet as many bright and you define it successful people in this profession as you can you know one of the greatest blessings of my career when i came into the the profession or the industry is just finding the time to go out joining the pers you know not personal finance society um you know but more importantly the the ifp yeah. And going just to meet people, and I remember I used to carry, this might not be for everyone I accept, you know, I used to carry, uh, you know, before podcasting became a thing, I would carry this tiny little recorder, and yeah. I would go out and I will introduce, I will send emails to people ahead of, you know, the branch meetings or the national conferences, and I would say, look, I know you're successful in this space. I follow you on Twitter or on social media. I've seen you on LinkedIn. I've read in industry press. I know about you. Would you spare 30 minutes of your time just for me to interview you? I can tell you this. Nobody said no. Nobody. Nobody. It doesn't matter who they are in the profession. I cannot remember anyone saying this. So I would say to young people, if you can be encourage yourself to find role models in this profession 
and lift your head a little bit above the parapet to introduce yourself and meet them, the world really is your oyster because this is such uh, a, a, a helping profession yeah. with a lot of great people, a lot of role models, um, you know, for you to connect with. And and, um, and I guess ultimately it's a profession that's built on relationships, isn't it? That's absolutely. What everybody in this profession does is great conversations because that's what their job is all about a lot of the time. Isn't it? That's the real value that they're bringing. So don't be shy and go for it, I guess. Uh, absolutely. Absolutely. And back to the kind of technology side of things then in, in terms of you obviously saw tech sucks in this industry i want to do something better i want to change the way that you know planners and advisors are working with their clients and, and doing business how have you seen the financial planning process changing over the years and, and in particular the impact that technology like yours has had on that process well the 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 fundamental thing that I see today is that increasingly advisors are recognizing that the value that they add to clients isn't so much in the investment piece, isn't so much in the, um, you know, picking of funds piece. Mm. It's much more in a really creating a, a a plan for clients and having a deep ongoing relationship with clients um you know in a way that is fulfilling to the clients and that helps them achieve their goals and objectives and so i hate to say it that the technology still has a lot of ways to go. You know, in, in many cases, the technology is still getting in the way of that process um, rather than uh, facilitating that process. So, for instance, we've talked about how technology can help advisors. Some of the things we see on, on our platform is where advisors can complete, let's say, um, you know, 60% of the ta tasks on, on, on the tech stack. So, mm -hmm. you know, from fact finding, risk profiling, um, you know, creating a plan for the clients, analyzing their existing portfolio, all of those things, um, you know, what used to happen in the past uh, still happens largely today is that you as an advisor, you will be chasing your tail. So you will maybe send Excel spreadsheet to the client to do a fact find, God forbid, a PDF. And then when that data comes back, your admin people or your para planner will key in that data to the uh, cash flow modeling tool. And also then they will log into another tool to key in the investment portfolio. And then they will send risk profile thing to the, to the client and that will come back and that's sitting on a different tech stack. And once they've done all of these things, then they will, you know, rekey all, all of this information to a report uh, thing to create a report for, for, for the client. And then you go out, you speak to the clients, get the, the uh, you know, permission to go ahead. Then you will go log into the platform open an account to the for the client and rekey all of this information. Oh, by the way, you need to rekey this information on on the on the on your CRM or back office system. And then once all of that's done, then uh, you set up the account and things are started to run, then you will maybe introduce a portal to the client with all of their stuff in there. And, and I think that we're starting to see that change where you know the advisor can start a process um you know and send out the the fact find to the client digital fact find on, on our technology send out the risk profile on the technology by the time all of that information comes back the technology automatically creates what we call a baseline plan 
Mm -hmm. because the data is there and the advisor can then go in and, you know, personalize the, that plan and get it ready for the client conversation. So we've done a lot of job, a lot of work um, trying to streamline the first half of that journey. Uh, you know, they can uh, bring the portfolio into, into our tech stack, analyze the portfolio, have it, you know, I wouldn't say a full picture of everything, but they can have a, quite a comprehensive picture of, of the client. There is still a lot of work to do in terms of account opening. Yeah. You know, bringing portals like yours into, into the equation. You know, uh, there, there is still a, a lot of work to do ultimately where you have uh, you know, a completely streamlined process. I don't know what your experience is. Is it, is it different uh, in, when, when you different. talk to firms about No, this? it's not different. And I think some of that stuff that you've, you've talked about still goes on, typically. People will have six or seven different systems. They're rekeying stuff. You know, we're all trying to solve that problem from different ends. And, and you know, hopefully we'll get there eventually. But I'd, I, don't think, I don't think you're wrong in that there is a lot of work to be done. But did you, how have you found, because it strikes me that, that planning tools... Um, are the one piece of technology that you are getting advisor adoption on, right? Advisors tend to not not be keen, shall we say, to adopt new technology. Mm. And I think that's understandable because, like you said, it puts a barrier in between them and what they see as their core function, which is looking after their clients and having really good conversations with their clients and advising with their clients and planning with their clients. Um, so uh, advisor adoption is certainly a challenge for us that we work on. We want a bit of a mission to show advisors that technology doesn't have to be complicated and it doesn't have to be a barrier to what they do. It should be complementing what they do. I know that advisors struggle with their back offices and CRNs, but it strikes me that you sit in a slightly different place here because advisors are using your technology. And how have you found that adoption process with your advisors and you know what what's the the attitude that you're seeing from advisors out there towards technology like yours well i nearly give up on timeline <laughs> or or you know or or or, or the, the business nearly died because in the first 18 months of launching the the tech we saw you know, like a massive uh, adoption. You know, you get all these early adopters yeah. who come in and sign in for the technology and they give you that initial attraction. And then for the middle year, the, the, the following year, um, we struggled because we just flatlined yeah. and there was nothing I we didn't try internally to kind of get this thing moving and and we really really struggled the turning point for us came in march of 2020 <laughs> you can remember a couple of <laughs> yes. things happened in march of 2020 then. wasn't there something something quite yeah. big happened then i think wasn't it what was it <laughs> yeah i can't think right <laughs> now the most important thing that happened in March of 2020 is that we came to the market with our model portfolio service. So we said to, um, you know, advisors that we're going to bring a model portfolio service to the to the to the to the market. It's going to be, uh, you know, low cost. You know, you're talking nine basis point, and um, you know, which is like a third of the going rate at the time. And then we're going to use our scale to bring costs down. And as part of that package, you're going to get a tech stack that includes, you know, fact find, risk profile, um, you know, cash flow modeling, tax planning, portfolio analytics tool. That single thing changed the, the you know, the, the journey for us, right? Mm -hmm. And what we saw is we went from zero to a hundred million AUM in by the end of 2020, we got to 750 by 21, and we got to you know 1.7 billion by the end of 22. Uh, now, unless the market, except that the market keeps pushing us back, we're we're knocking on the two billion mark. And what we found, the key learning for us is that the pain for advisors 
just to substitute one technology for another or to introduce a new technology that they're not currently using doesn't is is it doesn't overcome it's not big enough the pain of single point technology substitution is not big enough for them to adopt um you know just a single point technology but when you give them a far more comprehensive package of solutions that not only benefits them but also benefit their clients you know because reduces cost for their clients yeah gives their client a better you know better experience and also reduces inefficiency in their own business. It's transformational. You know, we 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 we're now Q, we're not even end of Q1. We've already signed 60% of what we did in the entire 22. Wow. And, and that's how compelling the, the, the adoption is. So so my point is that. For every technology provider in, in, in our space, um, we need to work harder to provide what is a, my team use the phrase, we need to give people painkillers, not just vitamins, right? <laughs> you know, <laughs> and, and, you know, there are people who are not going to, you know, I say to my team, my sales team, get to a no very quickly, right? There are people who are not going to adopt what we do, not going to, or not ready for what we do. That's fine. We'll move on to the next one. So that's what seems to be working for us at the moment, you know, creating a, a, a comprehensive set of solutions that solves not just one uh, or even two problems, but, you know, multiple problems for advisors, and you know we create a win-win-win situation um, as part of that strategy. And what and what's next for timeline? What's your direction of travel? What's, <laughs> the, what's the thing keeping you up for this year, Abraham? What's 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 next? What's the next big thing on your list that we need to tackle? Yeah, like I said to you, I think we're about sixty percent of the way in terms of um, you know the streamlining the the advice journey for clients there is still a lot of pain points you yeah. know we still don't have you know two-way integration with you know some of the back office systems out there we have a one-way integration we have two way or one and a half way with another one you yeah, know. yeah i feel your pain <laughs> i feel your pain <laughs> still, still a lot of work to do there we don't have um, as as much coverage of the platform market as we should, you know. So again, we still pull data into into something like eighty percent of them. We cannot send data back to anyone um, uh, other than one, maybe one or two. Not because of the work that we have to do, just because of the work that they have to do. And I've, you know, there's temptation to give up on that. You know, client portal is another one that we haven't uh, done a lot, a, you know, enough work on in terms of integration. You know, so th there is still work to do. Ultimately, and you and I, you and I can change that one, right? We yeah, can, absolutely. Uh, we we can. I, yeah. We can sort that one out. We'll have a, we'll have an offline conversation about that one, Abraham. Definitely. Yes. Yeah, so, yeah. So it's for us. It's we're going to continue to work harder to join that the journey up for the advisor as 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 much as possible, and um, who knows where that's going to take us? Yeah, and it, you know it sounds similar. We're we're on a you know one of our we feel we've kind of cracked advisor client communications right. And this is your piece about about integration, and a lot of our platform integrations are one way, and we're getting a lot of data out, but 
you know, we see there is a real gap because we we manage all that process and our, our, our clients will be using um, tools like timelines within that process. There's more we could do on that, of course. We kind of crack that piece, advisor and client and the communications and the processes that go between them. And then it kind of gets to go out to platform and it kind of falls off a cliff. <laughs> oh, OK. And then that lovely process comes to an end. And now I've got to go over here and I've got to rekey. And, you know, the, the process becomes much more disconnected. There's obviously compliance issues with that in terms of having all mm. that mm. so i think you know i think the the fintechs like us you know can hopefully start to put some more pressure on because you're right you are tempted to give up with it but i i think if uh if there are any platforms out there listening today they should be you know knocking on our door rather than us knocking on their door right because we can change the game and actually make it easier for firms to do business with those platforms right that's what it's absolutely about. absolutely and and you know what i say to platform is that if they don't, which many of them choose not to, I have never seen anything like what we're seeing right now in terms of the number of new entrants to the platform market that are, are intent, they are hell bent on eating the lunches of traditional platforms, mm. you know. So, and, and when you have you know, ex-CEOs of platforms like David Ferguson, Bill Fasiliev, um, you know, Hugo Thurman coming back <laughs> and saying, this is just not good enough. And they are essentially each of them promoting their own different way of re revolutionizing platform. Yeah. This should strike fear in the heart of any current CEO of platform and the only way to defend against this onslaught or even give yourself a chance is to step up and start talking to you know people like Tess and myself and, <laughs> and others in that space because otherwise I am so convinced that the gale of creative destruction is going to sweep the the platform market unless unless the the incumbents you know sit up and and really start pulling their weight. What a message to to come to nearly the end of our <laughs> podcast. On the gale of creative destruction is coming your way, so sit <laughs> and take notice and. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I, I I agree with that. And I think your views, you probably put it a lot stronger than I ever would, but I don't, I have to say, I don't disagree with that. And I hope that, you know, there are some people out there listening, thinking, oh, okay, time to pick the phone up, time to kind of think about what we can do next. I did say that I'm not going to be controversial or opinionated, you know, on, on this podcast. Of of course. Yeah. No, that's <laughs> brilliant. Um, so look, before we finish, what, um, is there any any like closing thoughts you want to to give to to people listening today other than the platforms who've well and truly heard about the gale of creative destruction i'm going to reuse that all day today um what, what else do you want to finish on just give us your thoughts to finish off i think that you know of course we've talked about platform we've talked about you know people you know fintechs you know like you know like ourselves i think if anything for me it's um you know a message for advisors you know to say that don't take it for granted that the current status quo is just the way things should be. You know, there are truly people, um, you know, like, like yourselves, um, others in, in, in our space who are really trying and working hard, um, you know, to, to improve, you know, the work that you do. Some of that, you know, the reasons for that comes out of you know, just our own economic interests. You know, we want to create valuable businesses um, in this space. Uh, but a lot of that also comes from out of respect for, for, for what you do. And so, you know, I say to advisors, um, we do need minds ch mindset change, as you said, you know, in terms of adopting technology and, um, 
and, and giving technology a chance, you know, there, there is a lot of fear, or there was, maybe not so much, uh, about technology replacing advisors and things like that, AI, chat GPT, you know, yeah. let's say this, there is absolutely no reason in my mind to fear technology or, or even anything to suggest right now that you know, technology is going to replace the, the incredible value that a human advisor brings to the table. If anything, it's the contrary. Technology is going to make us, make the advisor incredibly more powerful, incredibly more efficient and profitable. And so technology is our savior, not, not our enemy. They are. They're what drives efficiency. So you commute, I always say computers are brilliant at doing repetitive tasks time and time again without getting bored, but they can't do empathy. They can't mm, do mm. nuances in financial planning. They, they, they don't have judgment. They don't have empathy. They don't have all that stuff that we humans bring to the process. So the perfect blend of tech and human is really what's going to change the game for our financial advisors out there, I, I think. Agreed. So before we finish, where can people find you online? Give us your contact details if they want to, to get in touch with you. Now they've heard all about the fantastic stuff that you're doing out there. Yeah, if you don't mind, you know, your blood pressure rising a couple of <laughs> points up. Sure, <laughs> do it. Follow me on Twitter at your own peril. It's, it's Abraham on money. Brilliant. Abraham, it's been a delight to chat to you today. So thank you so much for taking the time to come on the Advisor and Tech podcast. And I hope you have a brilliant rest of the day. Thanks for having me, Tess. Thanks for the incredible work that you do. Oh, you're very welcome.